Hey guys, in this series of videos, we're going to cover subtopic 2.2 on equilibrium and yield. Our first science understandings are chemical systems may be open or closed, and over time, reversible chemical reactions carried out in a closed system at fixed temperature eventually reach a state of chemical equilibrium. To get us started, we're just going to address what chemical equilibrium is all about. It's concerned with how far a reaction proceeds, as opposed to how fast a reaction proceeds, which is what we refer to as the rate of the reaction. Now in terms of reversible reactions, these are types of chemical reactions that can occur essentially forwards as well as backwards, in saying that reactants can convert into products, but likewise products can convert into reactants. And these types of reactions we use a double arrow to indicate a reversible reaction. Some examples of reversible reactions include the conversion of nitrogen dioxide to nitrogen tetroxide. We've got the partial ionization of a weak acid. Thermal decomposition of hydrogen iodide and reduction of copper oxide by hydrogen. We're going to revisit these particular examples later, looking at how we can observe uh, reversible reactions, especially when they are at equilibrium. Now looking at this term equilibrium, we're going to consider this scenario. So as reactants A and B are added, they're going to produce a product called C. We could represent it in this uh, reversible uh, equation, so A plus B can go to produce C and backwards as well. We can say that the rate of the forward reaction is initially going to be high as the concentration of A and B are going to be high. This will increase the likelihood that they will collide and successfully collide. We know that this rate is going to decrease over time based on our work on rates of reactions. And this is because A and B are being used up. So in other words, the concentration of A as well as B are decreasing. So this will reduce the likelihood of collisions and successful collisions. In contrast, we can say that the rate of the backward reaction, that is C going to produce B and A, starts off at zero as the concentration of C essentially is zero at the beginning. This rate is going to increase over time as C is being produced. This information can be summarized in this diagram here. So if we have a look at the rate of a reaction, initially high for the conversion of reactants to products, so in other words the forward reaction, you can see it starts to decrease, but it doesn't get to a point where it's equal to zero, so it gets to a kind of steady point. In contrast with the products, so converting back into the reactants, in other words the backward or the reverse reaction, we can see that initially it is zero, but the rate actually starts to increase until again it reaches this point where it actually becomes balanced. And we can see that the forward and the backward reaction essentially converge to the same point. And where the rates actually converge is when we actually say the system has reached equilibrium. So that's the rate of the forward and the rate of the backward reaction equaling one another. So in summary, for reversible reactions that occur what we say in a closed system at constant temperature, dynamic equilibrium is reached when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. What we mean by a closed system is where reactants and products can't be lost to or gained from the surroundings, so everything is contained within a particular vessel. It's important to understand that equilibrium is a dynamic process because the concentrations of reactants and products eventually become constant. So it seems as if that the concentrations aren't changing, but that's not to assume that the reactions have completely stopped. What's happening is that the reactants are being consumed at the same rate they're being produced. Another way of looking at it is that the products are being consumed at the same rate that they're being produced as well. This links into the next science understanding, the changes in concentrations in reactants and products as a system reaches equilibrium, can be represented graphically. We need to know how to draw and interpret graphs representing changes in concentrations of reactants and products. This is something that I'm going to cover in a later video as well, because we're going to see how particular changes to a system in equilibrium can also be represented graphically and how we can extract the information from it. In this slide, we've got two different graphs uh, of concentration of reactants and products over time. And we can see in both cases, 
it's reached a state of dynamic equilibrium, but both can look a little bit different. So let's have a look at what information is provided here. On to the graph on the left, we can see that the reactants started up here, they've reached a, a constant concentration, and that's when it's actually uh, reached a state of equilibrium. Likewise for the products here, as it increases, but it becomes constant. In this case, the product concentration is higher than the reactants, uh, what we say is that the equilibrium favours the products. Another way of saying it is that equilibrium lies to the right. So in this diagram, in this graph on the right, we can see the reverse case. The reactant concentration is actually higher than the products at equilibrium. So we say it favours the reactants or the equilibrium lies to the left. Keep in mind that very rarely would the concentrations of both reactants and products equal one another. But what we know is that the rates equal one another when they've reached equilibrium, not the amounts or the concentration. On this slide we're looking at the equilibrium between nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen tetroxide. And the crucial point with this particular slide is that the changes in the concentration of N2O4 and NO2 link directly into the mole ratio of the reactants and products depending on how you look at it. If we look at the top, we can see here N2O4 being converted into two lots of NO2. And what this says is for every one molecule or one mole of N2O4, two molecules or two moles of NO2 will be produced. So we'll end up with twice the increase in concentration compared to the decrease in N2O4 concentration. So we can see that over onto the left side here, NO2 has increased by twice the amount that N2O4 has decreased. And very much the same thing over to the right. NO2 is actually decreased in this case by twice the amount that N2O4 has increased. So this is looking at the formation of N2O4 instead. During equilibrium, there are several different observable properties of a system that will remain constant. This can include the temperature of the system, the pressure, the color, as well as the pH. Coming back to our previous examples of reversible reactions, NO2 being converted into N2O4. At equilibrium, we get a constant shade of brown. For the ionization of a weak acid, we would end up with a constant pH being attained. For the decomposition of hydrogen iodide, we get this constant shade of purple, which is contributed uh, by the iodine gas here, as well as a constant gas pressure and finally, looking at the reduction of copper oxide, we would expect to see a constant gas pressure observed. This is our next science understanding. The position of equilibrium in a chemical system at a given temperature can be indicated by a constant called the Kc value related to the concentrations of reactants and products. You'll need to know how to write Kc expressions that correspond to given reaction equations for homogeneous equilibrium systems. I've defined the word homogeneous here, and it's essentially the case where all reactants and products exist in the same phase or the same state. So to consider the equilibrium constant Kc, we're going to look at this general reaction where A lots of reactant A reacting with B lots of reactant B can go to produce C lots of C and D lots of D and vice versa, given it's a re reversible reaction. At a particular temperature, the Kc value is equal to the concentration of the product C raised to a power of its coefficient, which is C, multiplied by the concentration of D raised to the power of its coefficient. This is all divided by the concentration of A raised to the power of its coefficient, multiplied by the concentration of B raised to the power of its coefficient. So this would be true for any reaction that is a homogeneous equilibrium system. Essentially, the value Kc is an indication of yield. And what this does is it compares the product concentrations up the top versus the reactant concentrations at equilibrium. To finish up this video, we're going to look at two examples, and we're going to look at writing equilibrium expressions for them. So for the first one, part A, we've got the production of sulfur trioxide. 
our Kc value is equal to the concentration of our product, SO3, raised to the power of its coefficient, so it's squared, divided by the concentration of the reactants, firstly SO2, raised to the power of its coefficient, multiplied by the concentration of oxygen, raised to the power of its coefficient. Because there is a 1 essentially at the front of O2, the concentration of O2 is just raised to a power of 1, but we don't need to show that. There's the expression for part A. For part B, we've got the reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen gas to produce ammonia. So the Kc value in this case is equal to the concentration of NH3 squared divided by the concentration of N2 multiplied by the concentration of H2, and this is cubed. And if you look at both cases, you can see that on the left I've shown the states, on the right I haven't shown the physical states, but it doesn't really matter when you write your equilibrium expression, whether you include it or not. That concludes part one of this video series. I'll see you guys in the next video.